Now, what is the incidence of hypoxic? Uh, what is the incidence of these birth injuries? In 1970, it was found that there were 64 deaths per 100,000 uh, births related to the birth trauma. In 1985, there were 7.5 deaths per 100,000 births related to the birth trauma and 88% deadline. The birth trauma causes less than 2% of neonatal death as well, and that averages 6 to 8 injuries per 1,000 births. Now, what are the main predisposing factors for the traumatic birth injury? First predisposing factor is that the priming gravida, then um, CPD, small maternal stature, and uh, maternal pelvic anomalies, prolonged or rapid labor arrest of um, descent or presenting part, oligohydramnias, resuscitation with the CPR, abnormal presentation which may be breach of face, use of the forcep or vacuum extraction, and version and very low birth weight infants or extreme prematurity, macrosomia and large fetal weight and fetal anomalies, fetal neuromuscular disease and HIE. Okay, what type of the birth injuries we commonly encounter? First of all, we may um, we may encounter the soft tissue injuries in the form of abrasion, bruising, fat necrosis, and laceration. And these injuries may be in the form of extra cranial bleeding, like um, capid sextum, uh, cephalhematoma, subgaleal hematoma. And there might be certain intracranial bleeding like uh, subacroid hemorrhage, epidural, subdural, cerebral, cerebellar injuries. The nerve injuries might be there in the form of the facial, cervical nerve root, Horner syndrome, recurrent laryngeal nerve injuries. And the fractures may be in the form of fractured of the clavicle, humerus, and femur and skull. Okay, and we may also encounter dislocations, stroticulitis in the form of sternocleidomastoid injuries and eye injuries in the form of subconjunctival and retinal hemorrhage. We may have solid organ injuries like liver, spleen, kidney and adrenal gland. The most common type of the injuries might be clavicular fracture and the facial nerve injuries, brachial uh, plexus injury, intracranial hemorrhage, humerus fracture, diaphragmatic paralysis, and spinal cord injuries, and depressed skull fracture. Life-threatening injuries may be in the form of liver lacerations, subgaleal hemorrhage, and large subdural blood collections. Okay, we may have certain type of the soft tissues injuries in the form of bruises and platycia can be seen in genital urinary area in the breech presentation and can be seen around the head and neck and when there is a knuckle cord or precipitous uh, delivery. Appearance of the new bruises or petechiae after delivery warrant further investigation to rule out the sepsis DIC or bleeding disorder. Okay, the soft tissue injuries include the fat necrosis which are well circumscribed form nodule with a purplish discoloration usually occur after force abuse but can occur at other side of the trauma as well and um, they usually resolve spontaneously over week to month we may have nasal uh, deformities less than one percent of the nasal deformities are due to actual dislocation of triangular cartilage of the nasal septum and we need to differentiate from positional deformities by manually moving the septum to midline and observe the resulting shape of the nares. Okay, true dislocation is when there is a marked asymmetry of the nares persist, and in that case, we have to consult the ENT. And when there is failure to recognize a true dislocation, that can lead to permanent deformity. So it's very important to check for the nasal deformity. Okay. Extracranial hemorrhage, and uh, these are in the form of cabbage succedaneum, cephal hematoma, subgaleal hematoma, epidural hematoma, and we might have certain injuries under the skin as well. The cabbage succedaneum, this is cabbage succedaneum, common after prolonged labor, and there is accumulation of the blood serum above periosteum and soft tissue swelling, edema, petechiae, anechoimosis, and it often crosses the suture. It's very important that it crosses the suture. This is cephal hematoma. Cephalhematoma occurs uh, after prolonged labor and instrumentation. It is a secondary to the rupture of the vessels traversing the skull to the periosteum. And often fluctuant swelling, well demarcated, does not cross the suture line. Okay, so, so capet succedaneum crosses the suture line, but uh, uh, this uh, cephalhematoma does not cross the suture line and no overlying skin discoloration is there and it most often unilateral but can be bilateral and possible skin, uh, skull fracture sometimes elevated ridges are there and with the linear fracture there is a risk for the leptomeningitis as well 
okay so these are different type of the subcalial hemorrhages subcalial hemorrhage occurs between the periosteum and epicranial ap aponeurosis and most often with a difficult vacuum or the forcep extraction it occurs in 1 in 2000 deliveries or in 1 in 200 of the uh, vacuum it usually occurs <clears throat> and what happens in subgalial hemorrhage we have bogey fluid collection with a fluid wave beneath the skull mm, the galea uh, galea epineurotica extends from occipit to the eyebrow in the anterior and posterior direction and later to the insertion of the temporalis fascia the injury results from attraction on the skull that shears the emissary veins between the skull and intracranial venous uh, sinuses presents with the pallor tachycardia tachypnea mortling hypotension hypotonia hemorrhage and shock there is fluid uh, collection uh, increases after the birth and occipital circumference will increase 1 cm with each 40 ml of the blood deposited in the subepineurotic space intracranial bleeding and multi organ dysfunction from ischemia can occur if the volume is not preserved it can cause the consumptive coagulopathy. Prognosis correlates with a degree of brain ischemia forming delayed or incomplete correction of the blood loss and hypertension. How do we manage the situation? Central venous access, aggressive uh, volume replacement and correction of the acidosis, monitored hematocrit and coagulation. And the skull fracture, mostly linear, often with the cephalhematoma, often usually after uh, prolonged labor or the force of delivery. And fetal skull pressed against the symphysis pubis, uh, cranial promontory or the ischial spine. And there is a risk of the lump to manage cyst as well. And follow up x-ray approximately two months after injury. So depressed skull fracture is shown here. Intracranial hemorrhage. In intracranial hemorrhage, we may have the epidural hemorrhage, we may have subdural hemorrhage. The epidural hemorrhage is rare, usually associated with the fracture, and there is inability, lethargy, and seizure progress to signs of increased intracranial pressure, ultimately uncle ulceration, and it is diagnosed by CT. Subdural hemorrhage is diagnosed by CT, may be due to rupture of the straight sinus, vein of the gallon, transverse sinus, inferior sagittal sinus, or superficial bridging vessels. Symptoms within 24 hours of the birth, apnea, seizures, activity, altered state, irritability, focal neurological signs, or loss of the consciousness. And with, with midline shift, consider neurosurgical treatment. It can cause secondary uh, cerebral infarction due to arterial compression. Okay, so intracranial hemorrhage is shown over here. We may have epidural hematoma here and subdural hematoma over there. Intracranial hemorrhage. Subarachnoid hemorrhage often is asymptomatic. There is irritab uh, irritability and seizures, CSF blood collection, CT scan helps in the diagnosis. Intracerebral can present with the signs of the uh, brain stem compression and intraventricular hemorrhage, mostly premature uh, infants uh, it occurs and less likely caused by the intrapartum factors and the risk of the post hemorrhage hydrocephalus is there okay now coming to operative vaginal delivery um, which can cause the birth trauma so in what cases operative vaginal delivery causes the birth trauma first of all in prolonged stacking stage nearly paris women lack of continuing progress for three hours with the regional anesthesia or two hours without regional anesthesia and anesthesia and multi paris women lack of continuing progress for two hours with the regional anesthesia or one hour without regional anesthesia and when there is suspicion of immediate or potential fetal compromise and shortening of the second stage for, for maternal benefits so in these cases we apply the uh, forcep or vacuum now use of vacuum is associated with a much less maternal trauma vacuum associated with increase in neonatal retinal hemorrhage and cephalhematoma okay and retinal hemorrhage there is twofold increased risk with the vacuum versus forcep data on the long-term consequences of these hemorrhage fail to demonstrate any significant effect and some studies reveal new need delivered by um, vacuum assisted vaginal delivery more likely to be readmitted with the jaundice okay now vacuum versus force of vacuum easier to apply and slower delivery increased risk of um, trauma and drug cranial trauma higher chance of healing not recommended in less than 34 to 36 weeks and in case of the forceps more difficult to apply foster delivery increased maternal soft tissue trauma and requires better analgesia and it can occur at any gestation age now vacuum versus forceps particular indications for procedures are there and anesthesia availability of the instruments and uh, training experience of the physician and patients 
preferences. So these determine whether we need to use the vacuum or foursome. Now sequential use of the vacuum or foursome. Okay. Sequential use increases the likelihood of adverse outcome more than the sum of uh, relative risk of each individual instruments. Okay, so failure in, in cases of operative vaginal delivery, true failure is not when vaginal delivery is not accomplished, but when a preventable injury is inflicted. Okay, now shoulder dystocia. In case of the shoulder dystocia, there might be certain birth injuries. The incidence of the shoulder dystocia is one in 300 of deliveries, and there is a lack of uniform definition by ACOG defines this as additional obstetric maneuvers uh, following the failure of the gentle downward traction on the fetal head to elective delivery of the shoulders and when there is prolonged head to body delivery time of more than 60 seconds. Okay, and what are the risk factors for the shoulder dystocia? The risk factors include first of all macrosomia and fetal anthropometric variation, secondly, maternal diabetes and obesity, third is operative vaginal delivery, fourth is precipitous delivery and prolonged second stage of the labor, fifth is history of the shoulder dystocia and macrosomic baby and post uh, pregnancy and advanced maternal age. So these are all the risk factors for the shoulder dystocia. Now, traumatic nerve and spinal cord injuries as a result of shoulder dystocia. Okay, fetal complications of the shoulder dystocia include brachial plexus injury, which occurs in 2 to 7 percent at the birth, reducing to 3 percent at 12 months of the age. Brachial plexus injury that involves the C4 phrenic nerve palsy, C5, 6, plus minus C7, Ars palsy or Ars Duchenne palsy in 80% of the brachial plexus injury. In C8 to T11, we may have the Klatsky palsy. In C5 to T1, we may have complete brachial plexus injury um, or Ars Klatsky palsy in combination. Okay, so brachial plexus injury, no matter the cause, care should involve multidisciplinary approach including pediatric, uh, pe uh, pediatric neurosurgery, physical therapy and possible referral to the brachial plexus injury center. Now, Arab's Duchenne palsy, C5, C6, plus minus C7. Classic posture results uh, of paralysis, weakness in the shoulder muscles, elbow flexure, and forearm supinators. Affected arm hangs and is internally rotated and extended and is pronated. Oftentimes, C7 also involved causing loss of innervation to the forearm, wrist, and finger extensors. The loss of the extension causes the wrist to flex and the fingers to curl up in the waiter's step position. Now, Arms Duchenne palsy, which involves C5, C6, plus minus C7, obstetric literature less than 10% permanent. Pediatric or orthopedic literature shows that permanent injury occurs in up to 15 to 25% of the cases. Okay, in Klamke palsy, which involves this, uh, C8 to T1, there is a weakness of the tricep force, uh, forearm supinators and wrist factor fluxers uh, leading to the claw-like paralyzed hand uh, with a good elbow and the shoulder function. Upper arm function differentiate clamp key palsy from the arms palsy. Only 40% of the clamp key palsy is resolved by one year of the life and it is associated with Horner syndrome with second sensory deficit on the affected side and constriction of the pupil and the doses of the eye is caused by the cervical sympathetic nerve injury. This is Horner syndrome. Phrenic nerve palsy, lateral hyperextension of the neck causes overstretching or evulsion of the third, fourth, and fifth cervical root with supply phrenic nerve. Respiratory distress, risk of infection, elevated hemidiaphragm, paradoxical diaphragmatic movement, and atelectatic areas. If no improvements within one month, recovery unlikely and plagiation needs to be considered. Now, laryngeal nerve injury. Laryngeal nerve is a part of the vagus nerve in the neck behind the jugular vein and carotid artery. 10% of the vocal cord paralysis is caused by the birth trauma and horse cry strider. Risk of the aspiration feeding problems are there. Recovery often occurs over 4 to 6 weeks, sometimes longer. Now, coming to the fractures. Incidence of the shoulder dystocia is... Uh, what, one to two percent incidence with the shoulder dystocia is one to two percent and majority involves a clavicle 
humerus most common long bone fracture and almost invariably heals with a simple supportive, supportive therapy and do not uh, lead to permanent disability. Now these are some types of the subcapsular liver hemorrhages. Subcapsular liver hemorrhage, um, those patient, um, who are the patients who are at risk, those are uh, insulin, diabetes, mellitus suffering patient, erythroblastosis fidelis, um, breach delivery and um, sometimes when the resuscitation is done, these are the babies at risk. Can leads to anemia, pallor, poor feeding, tachycardia, and tachypnea, and also abdominal distension, bluish discoloration, and hematoperitoneum and shock. How is diagnosis done? Diagnosis is done by ultrasound and subsequent laparotomy. What therapy is needed? Surgery as soon as possible. PRBC, FFP, platelets, transfusion. Hypoxic injury. Essential criteria must meet all the four. First of all, evidence of metabolic acidosis in fetal and black core. Obtain and delivery pH of less than 7 and based deficits of more than 12. Early onset severe, moderate neonatal encephalopathy, cerebral palsy, exclusion of other identifiable etiologies. Criteria that collectively suggest an intraportum timing within the close proximity to labor and delivery, for example, 0 to 48, but are non specific to asphyxial results. Teamwork is very important, multidisciplinary team approach in, involving the team of doctors brings about the better uh, results that include the obstetrician, pediatrician, orthopedic team, neurosurgeons. And better communication is important when the parents are awaiting the arrival of the new baby. It's the responsibility to tell them that there are many steps that must be taken to ensure that the delivery is safe and easy as possible. These steps always involve the help and support of the team. That can include a range of professionals soon after delivery discussion with the patient and family with a complete, immediate, accurate information is necessary. And events of the delivery must be documented by the care team members in, involved. And last but not the least, we need to communicate with the patient and the relatives. Communication is very much important. Thank you so much for your patience.